Today's staff, we're going to be learning is Bava Metzia Daf Lamechet. This is the Daf for Shabbat. We're going to get started right from the Mishnah at the top of the Daf. So our Mishnah says, Somebody gives a friend fruits to watch, produce. You cannot touch them. If you're supposed to watch somebody's fruits, even if they're about to rot, get ruined, something like that, you are not allowed to touch them. Ashbagomer, in the minute in the Gemara, we're going to see what the issue is. Ashbagomer, Mochan Bifne Beitim, Mipne Shukim Shiva Vedala Balin. Ashbag says, What are you talking about? You, of course, you can sell them. And in fact, what do you do? You sell them in front of the court. In other words, the court helps you assess, I guess, to make sure that you're getting a fair price for them because you're returning a lost item to the owner. The owner would otherwise be suffering a huge loss. So now the Gemara says, and Rashbag actually makes a lot of sense. So my time, the Gemara wants to know what's the reason for the rabbis. A person would rather have their own kav of, of, um, of produce than nine kavim of a friend. Kav is a measurement of volume. I'd rather have, okay, it's a bit of an exaggeration. In fact, the Gemara is going to say later they're clearly exaggerating, but you'd rather have your own produce talking recently to a friend who told me that how much her father loves the lemons on their tree, right? It's it's like something very unique when it's your own produce. So therefore, he'd rather have rotten or going to rot produce that's his own rather than someone else's. Rav Nachman bar Yitzhak Amar, he says a totally different reason. Chayshinan, it's more of a halachic reason. Chayshinan shema asa'an amafki tchuma umaser amakom achil. It could be that if I give you, let's say, my fruits to watch, and then I go somewhere else and I have other produce with me, I could take truma and maaser and say the stuff that's at home, that's going to be the truma and maaser, the tithes on my produce that I have now, so that you can eat your produce. And later you'll go back, you'll get those fruits, and you'll give them to the Kohen. So if they take the produce and give it to somebody, and let's say they're not a Kohen, who knows? Maybe I turn them into true my master and they can't go to a regular person. So those are the two possible reasons. We're now going to bring a question, a difficulty on Rav Nachman. Metive, which was the second reason about the truma. Now we quote a brayta. You give produce to your friend to watch. So far, so good. Therefore, balabayit ose otan truma o maaser makom achil. Therefore, the owner, me in this story, since I know you're not going to sell them, I can use it for my truma and masse. Now, this is a little tricky to understand. We'll see right now, according to who. Bishlama the Rav Kahana, according to Rav Kahana, this works, because you could say, Hainu de Katana Lefika. That's why it says Lefika, meaning step one is when I give my fruits to you to watch, you can't sell them because. We're assuming that when I come back, I'm going to prefer my own produce, even if it's not as good, even if it's starting to rot. And um, Rav Nachman, and, and therefore, wait, now the second part, therefore, since you can't sell them by law because of this issue of, we assume a person prefers their own produce, therefore, I'm going to want to come back and get my produce. Therefore, we know my produce will be there, and therefore I'm allowed to use it to take Truma Maser on my stuff that's with me now and say the Truma Maser is there because I can be certain that it's there. Let's try it according to Rav Nachum Bar Yitzchak. And here comes the problem. Ella Rav Nachum Bar Yitzchak, my Lefichach. Lefichach makes no sense. In fact, it's circular. Okay, let's try it. So if you leave produce again with your friend, your friend is not allowed to sell them because there's a concern that maybe it's truma maser and that you made a truma maser on your produce. And therefore you can make, you can take it and make it into your truma maser. Okay, that sounds kind of circular, right? In other words, okay, we're going to see in a minute that actually it does work. But it seems to be that there's something a little circular about the whole thing because both parts of it revolve around the same thing. Okay, get. I can't do it. I, I can't take Truman and Maser. I'm sorry. I can't. The person watching the produce can't sell it because I might do Truman and Maser. And therefore, I can't do Truman and Maser. 
So we're going to see in a minute it actually does work. And that's why I'm having a hard time convincing you why it's a problem or maybe not, but I find it a little hard to understand why it's exactly a problem. But it, it seems to be that we're using the same claim on both sides and that just sounds weird. But the Gemara says, I don't understand why that's a problem. Here's our answer. This is what it means to say. Since the rabbis instituted it, now that we've established it as a given, that if I give you fruits to watch, even if they start going bad, you cannot sell them because we're worried that maybe I'll make them truma and I, I've turned them into truma and then you can't sell them because you'll give them to a Yisrael who can't eat truma and won't even know it's truma. Well, therefore, in which case, we actually allow me to do it because since there's no concern that you're going to sell them, I actually am allowed to do it. Okay, so that actually works. I'm a Rabbi Barbarchan, I'm a Rabbi Yochanan. Now we're going to see something Rabbi Barbarchan quoted in the name of Rabbi Yochanan about our Mishnah. The Machloket in the Mishnah between the rabbis and Rashbag. So far, what we did in the Gemara is explain two opinions about the rabbi's position. Now we're just going to talk about the fact that there's a Machloket. Rashbag says you're allowed to sell them through the court, and the rabbis say you can't. So now Rabbi Yochanan says the Machloket is Bechte The Machloket is when it's a reasonable amount of deterioration of the value of the fruits, right? So they start going down, they start going a little bad, getting soft, that we get. And that's when they have a machloke. Can you sell them? Can you not sell them? But if they start going much more, much worse than what you would have expected, or they're kind of not really used, they're going to be rendered useless soon, then everybody agrees you can sell them because then it's really going to be a loss. Okay, there's a difference between soft fruits that are not so good anymore and rotten fruits. So So now the Gemara says, let's try to compare Rabbi Yochanan to the two answers we saw before. Obviously, he disagrees with Rabbi Nachman Bar Yitzchak because Rabbi Nachman Bar Yitzchak thinks you can't sell at all because of the truma problem. It's irrelevant how bad your fruits are going. But the question is, does Rav Kahana agree with Rabbi Yochanan or disagree? Does Rav Kahana say that you want your own produce, but not if it's really, really rotten, or even then you still might prefer your own produce? So Kika Amar Rav Kahana, here's the answer. When Rav Rav Kahana said what he said, you'd rather have one kav of your own stuff than nine kav of somebody else's, that's within, uh, uh, that means if it starts to deteriorate a normal amount, then we assume you still want your stuff. But once it gets beyond that, he actually agrees with Rabbi Yochanan that no, you can obviously sell it. But wait, it says, if the ratio is one to nine, and I'm happy with one of mine rather than nine of someone else's, well, then it should be I'm happy with my rotten produce as opposed to someone else's good produce. To which the Gemara says, Guzma Ba'ama. It's a total exaggeration. They didn't really mean that. Okay. And therefore, that's not a question. Metine. Now we're going to have two questions of Rabbi Yochanan. And they're going to be long questions. It's going to take us till the end of the daf, uh, the, this side of the daf, the end of the Amud. Metine. Lefichach balabayit oseo tantrumauma serama komachil. Now, this was the source we saw before. So it says, therefore, the balabayit, since the balabayit knows you're not going to sell it, Therefore, they can make it truma ma serama komacher. So if I give you fruits to watch, I can now separate out truma ma ser, basically not even physically separate out, just say my produce that you're watching is truma. Now, if those fruits get really rotten, you're allowed to sell them. Well, how can you sell them if I made them truma? Then you're going to be selling them to non kohanim That's a problem. To which, right, the Gemara asks, Maybe they got really bad and they sold them. Now, what's the problem? Well, the problem, there's a few problems, but, oh, sorry. I actually said the question wrong. The concern here is, and you'll see why I got confused, because we're going to attack this question in a few different directions. But the first concern here is that if I am, a, we said, since there's no concern you're going to sell them, I can use it for my truma mas here, which basically means that the produce I have with me, I'm going to say I can eat now because I've already, you can't eat until you tie the produce. And I can say whatever's in my house that you're watching over is truma. And my stuff that I have here, I can eat now. But what's the problem? 
the problem is that if let's say they rotted and you sold them because they were going bad before they totally rotted, you sold them, then I'm taking truma using the stuff that is no longer in my property. You might have sold it already. If you sold it, how can I possibly use it as my truma master? And then turns out what I did was useless. And now I have untithed produce and I'm eating it. That's called ka'achil tvalim. Tevel is untithed produce and you're not allowed to eat that. To which they answer, Obviously Rabbi Yochanan holds, this is so uncommon. And because it's so uncommon, I'm allowed to eat assuming that what I did was accurate, was, was valid, that I still own the produce. And therefore I turned it into truma. I don't see it, but I we can just assume that it did a rot more than it should have. Well, what if it did go bad? Well, now we get to the second problem, which I got confused with. I thought it was the first before. How do we sell them? Let's say the, they're, they're rotting. So I'm sitting somewhere else. I don't know what's going on. I can just assume that they're still there and I can eat my produce. But right, this is like we've seen before. We, 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 we assume by the rove, we assume the, the, the typical, it's fine. But as, as long as I don't know, and as long as I don't really have a way to check. But let's say you're watching them and they go really bad and you're allowed to sell them according to this. So according to Rabbi Yochanan, But aren't we worried that I maybe turned it into truma and now how can you sell it to a Kohen, uh, to a non-Kohen? So to which they answer, Oh, oh we forgot to mention but if you're going to sell it because it's rotting and it's going really bad, you can only sell it to Kohanim for the value of truma, the way it's sold in the Shuk, which is whenever you have an issue of truma, like maybe it's truma, like our case, we sell it to Kohanim, but they get a much better price for it because it's not a big market for this. So the demand is low and therefore you'll get a better price for it. Um, and you can only sell it to certain people. So basically you're at a disadvantage and therefore, you'll end up selling it for this low price. So now they're going to explain what the machloket between Rabbi Baruch Barachana is in the name of Rabbi Yochanan and Rav Nachman. Rabbi Baruch Barachana thinks it's very uncommon that things will rot more than they should or, you know, get to that really bad stage. Now, if it does, we're going to assume here that when it happens, it happened, before, what happens here is that the assumption, since it's so rare that it happens, probably I did the truma before it rotted. Okay, so I'm standing somewhere else. I say that stuff will be truma and it's probably still in my possession. And therefore, when I did the truma maaser, we assume it happened before the before it started rotting. And therefore, So if it actually starts rotting, at that point, we can potentially assume, in other words, the issue of me taking truma on it and it not being there, we're not really worried about that. Chances are I did it before it rot. Once it's starting to rot, you have the right to sell it. But again, Zabninu Lakwani Bidme Truma but you sell it to Kohanim for this lower price. So then we've resolved that. What's the diff What's the difference of opinion of Rav Nachman who doesn't allow for this? Rav Nachman, what do you mean? It's very common that things get ruined quickly, okay? And it could happen unexpectedly. And in fact, it sometimes happens immediately, which means that it's very likely that it will happen before I separate my truma to masra. And therefore, if we say I can, you can sell them, then then it might happen where you'll first sell it. And when I go to do truma and masra from somewhere else, what will happen? Now, I won't know that you sold it. And I'll end up eating untithed produce. So therefore, it all is rooted in how common do they think it is that produce gets ruined, right? Sometimes we have halachic differences of opinion. This is a difference of opinion based on a difference in reality.
made today. Second difficulty with Rabbi Yochanan. So that was the first difficulty, but we resolved. Second difficulty. So you have fruits that rotted, same like we've been talking. Wine, and it turns to vinegar. Now we're going to see this might not be exactly the same. Shemen behivish, oil and it's spoiled. Dvash behidvish, honey and it also spoiled. Harez elo yigabehem. So can't touch them, okay? Even though they totally got ruined or maybe partially, we'll see there's the fruits, which is partial. The wine and all those other things seem to be totally ruined. Give rei rabbi meil. Chachamim obrim, osen lahem takana. You do something to, you fix them. We don't know what this means yet. And you sell them in the court. Obviously, they must have some use, and the Gemara is going to ask later what use do they have if they're already ruined. And the rabbis continue and say, when you sell them, you have to be careful though. This is about being kind of making sure your good name is 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 stays intact. Because if you buy them, then people are going to be concerned that maybe it wasn't really rotten and you bought them and you claim they were rotten because you wanted to buy them yourself. So make sure to sell them to somebody else. Don't buy them yourself. Hayotsevo, and similarly, gaba'et staka, people who have staka money, they collect the money, they're the treasurers of the staka. Bizman she'en lahem aniyim lechalek, let's say they got a lot of small coins and they don't have poor people to give it to. Now the assumption is, here's going to be the similarity, that small coins start rotting at a certain point. They're, they're more easily more capable of rotting, like small pruto than the bigger coins. So what they need to do is they need to turn it into exchange it for bigger coins. Now, it's not like our currency where, okay, you have five pennies, that's a nickel. Five nickels, that's a quarter, right? We have a very clear system. Their system was based on weights and measurements. How big is this coin? How much is in it? It wasn't as clearly defined. Each coin was the exact same amount. So now, again, we're worried about a little bit of monkey business. So if you're the Gabayt Staka, if you don't have poor people who need your money right now, right? imagine such a thing, so you can exchange it into bigger coins that will be better, it'll keep better, and therefore the money won't go bad, but not yourself. If you're a money changer, you can't do that. You have to go to somebody else to do it, or even if you're not a money changer, but you happen to have bigger coins, don't use your own money because people will be concerned that maybe you're cheating. And furthermore, the people who are in charge of the food for the poor people, like the soup kitchen, if they don't have poor people to give it to, they sell the food to other people. But again, don't sell to yourself. Now, why do we bring this brayta as a difficulty for Rabbi Yochanan? So now that we've brought a very long brayta, they go back and they tell you which line was the critical line here. Says fruits that are rotting. And what does it say? Rabbi Meir says, don't touch them. But didn't we say if it's rotting more than it needs, right? More than the typical or getting close to rotting, then you can sell them. So, my love, afilu yeter mechdechas ronan, isn't this even more than, right? What do you assume? To which they say, no, mechdechas ronan. Why did you assume that? Perovi or kivu could be, they're starting to go bad. They're softening. They're getting soft. They're not, not that they're really ruined. But, doesn't help us with the next cases. I mean, what worse could they could be than your vin your wine turning to vinegar, your oil not being able to be used anymore, and your honey ruined? So the answer now, what what does Rabbi Yochanan say? In that case, you can sell it if you're let's say your fruits are going really, really bad. You can sell them before they get completely ruined, right? If I wait, if you wait, you're watching my fruits. You wait to sell them. By the time I get back, they'll be worth nothing. At least now, they're worth less, but they're not worth nothing. But these are not the same. Shane Hane came and become come. Once your wine turns to vinegar, it's not going to get any worse. Once your oil rotted, it's not going to get any worse than that. It's already bad. Okay, so therefore, Shemin, okay, therefore, these things are different. We don't have a, a an ability, according to Rabbi Mayer, to sell them because selling them won't do anything. When you When I come back, a month later, it'll be the same as it is today. So we'll just wait till I get back and give me the rotten oil. Now the Gemara asked the question we said before. Shem and bivish, tvash bivish, turning out on the bed. Lemai chaze. What are you going to do with these things? What can we use them for? So Shem and chaze legildai. 
the, the, the oil you can use to put on the leather. Okay, I guess it would soften the leather. And vash lektisha de galme. This we learned actually before that they would use honey. We learned this a long time ago. Maybe I want to say Masachet Shabbat. They would use honey to put on the wounds of the camels. Okay, so we have something to do with rotten honey. Bechachamim obrim. Okay, now going, so that we resolved what you're selling them for. Now, by the way, we're talking here now, the rabbis, we've switched. We started with Rabbi Meir, brought Rabbi Meir as a difficulty for Rabbi Yochanan. Now we're moving to the rabbi's opinion who says you can sell them. So the rabbis say we, we do something to fix them and we sell them in the court. So now they ask, what takana exactly are we doing? What does that mean? Takana is to fix something. What we do is we pour out the wine from the barrel and at least save the barrel because if we leave the rotten, the rotting wine or oil in the barrel for a long time, the barrel will be ruined, okay, or the jug or whatever it was in. So we remove it from what it's in, we sell that, and we at least save the jug for the owner. And but my commitment, what's the root of the machloka between Rabbi Meir and the rabbis? Now, the point here is that since Rabbi Yochanan basically said that Rabbi Meir will agree that even if it's more than Bechech Esronam, we basically established that, right, that the Perov Yerkivu is less, the shaman and the wine and all that is a unique exception because it's not going to change. But if it's something that's going to slowly deteriorate in value and it's already getting really bad that it's almost almost at the end there, then we allow you to sell it. So the rabbis also allow you to sell it. There. So which case do they, in other words, so then why do they disagree specifically in the wine honey case? Then my kamiflage. The mar savar lehefse meruba chashashu. Lehefse muat lo chashashu. Rabbi Meir holds we're worried about a huge loss. Like if your fruits are going to all go bad and you'll have nothing. So we're worried about that. But a minor half say we're not worried about. What's the minor half say here? Well, again, the wine's not going to change in value. So the main, the minor half say is the jars or the barrel. So that, it's a minor thing. It's not a big major thing. And therefore, we're not going to let you sell it. So we don't let you take the wine out of the barrel to save the barrel and sell it, right? Umar Savar, sell not the barrel, but sell the wine. Umar Savar, the rabbis say, no, you can sell the wine so that you save the barrel because they were concerned for a small loss. Now we're back to the mission. Okay, so again, so far, let's try to review our dafa right now. So far, what we've done is we have the Mishnah. We had a machloka between the rabbis and Rashbag. So far, we mainly dealt with the rabbis' opinion. The rabbi's opinion was, you can't touch them. And then we said, number one, what's the reason? We had two different opinions, Rav Kahana and Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak. Then after we discussed the reasons and brought a difficulty with Rav Nachman, but resolved it, we then went to the statement of Rabbi Yochanan that was quoted by Rabbi Rabbi Chana that said that if it's a real big loss, then we allow you to sell it. Even Tanakama will allow you to sell it. Then we brought two difficulties on Rabbi Yochanan but resolve that. That's basically what took us until now. And the second one we wanted to deal with, even though we brought Rabbi Meir, is the difficulty we wanted to explain the Chachamim as well. Now we go back to the Mishnah. You can sell them in court because you're like returning a lost item to the owners. So he has no problem selling fruits that are starting to go bad, even though they're not majorly bad. Itmar. Now we're going to have a, uh, a statement of Rabbi, Rabbi Abba, Rabbi Yaakov, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Halacha Kirashbag. Rabbi Amar Rabbi Nachman, Halacha Kedivrei Chachamim. So Itmar is usually an introduction to a machloket between a Moraim. In this case, it's a machloket about who we hold like in the mission. So Rabbi Yochanan is quoted as saying like Rashbag, and Rabbi Nachman is quoted as saying like the rabbis. Now we question the fact that Rabbi Abba, Rabbi Yaakov taught this in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, the he holds like Rashbag. The Gemara asks, and this is a methodological point, really. But why do we need an Amora to tell us something that Rabbi Yochanan already said some other time? Now, when did Rabbi Yochanan say this? Well, he didn't exactly say this directly, but there's certain principles we understand about Rabbi Yochanan, and this fits into the principle. So what is that? So Rabbi Yochanan quotes Rabbi Yochanan as saying, Koma kom. Anytime Rashbag appears in our Mishnah, arguing with the rabbis, 
Halacha kemoto, the halachas like him, we've actually seen this statement many times. Chutzme arev v'tzaydam v'raya achrona. So if we know that the halach is always like Rashbag, other than these three exceptions, why did Rabbi Yochanan say what he said? Okay, and that's why really did Rabbi Abba, the son of Rabbi Yaakov, say in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, the halach is like Rashbag, the halach is always like Rashbag, other than three unique exceptions. So before I talk about the three unique exceptions, which I'll review them again, so that by the time we finish Shas, you've got them under your belt. But Gamara answers, Notice, Rabbi, Rabbi Abba and Rabbi Yaakov quoted Rabbi Yochanan as paskening like Rashbag. Rabbi Barchana quoted Rabbi Yochanan as saying the halach is always like Rashbag. But that doesn't mean that Rabbi Abba thought that Rabbi Yochanan said that. So he didn't think Rabbi Yochanan said it. He just happened to say that he paskens like Rashbag in this case. But he didn't have that general principle that Rabbi Barchana quoted in the name of Rabbi Yochanan. And that's the resolution to the question. Okay, let's go through Arev, Saidan, and Raya Achrona. Let's see how well you remember. Arev is, if there's a loan and there's a guarantor for the loan, are you allowed to collect? Let's say the the bar the creditor wants to collect and just doesn't feel like dealing with the borrower. Okay? Let's say the borrower has money and wants to go straight to the guarantor. Are you allowed to? Rashbag says no. We actually don't hold like him in that case, but he says no. Saidan, another case where we don't hold like Rashbag. So, um... The, a man divorces his wife. There was a case. It happened in Saidan. That's why they call it Saidan. It's an actual case. Divorced his wife under condition that she return him his cloak. And then the cloak got lost and she couldn't return the cloak. So the question is, and Rashbag said, she could return the value of the cloak. But the rabbis disagreed and said, no, no, no. The condition to the get was if she returns the cloak. She didn't return the cloak. No get. And Raya Chrona, this is, there's a, a machloket in a Mishnah in um, a few Two issues come up, a diff, uh, difference of opinion between Rashbag and the rabbis about bringing proofs to court. And Raya is a proof. And the second, the last one, which is the second one, is the following machloket, which is, you say, I don't have witnesses. I don't have a proof for my side. And then they rule against you. And then later you bring witnesses. So Rashbag says, we allow you to be accepted. We we bring, let your witnesses come because what are we going to do? Like, you didn't know you had witnesses. You didn't know you had a proof. And now all of a sudden you have a proof. And the rabbis are a little suspect and say, what do you mean? You said you didn't have a proof. Now all of a sudden you pull a proof out of a, proof out of a hat. All of a sudden you produce witnesses. Maybe you're, you found people who are willing to take money to testify for you. And you should have done it in the first place. So Rashbag thinks you can bring, but we actually don't hold like him. Back to our Gemara. And now we're going to get into a topic that unfortunately is very relevant relating to hostages or captives. So now they're going to say the following. Rashbag, remember, said, you're allowed to sell the proper, you're allowed to sell the, the, the produce because it's like you're returning a lost item. You're basically helping your friend who would otherwise be losing out on their stuff and you're selling it. You're allowed to do that. So they say, you can learn from here, demoridim karov l'nechse shavuot. If someone is taken captive, we can basically send a relative to be in charge of the property. Okay? Now, what's the connection? Well, we're worried about a loss of money. So we allow the relative to make sure that you're not going to lose money on your land and help deal with your land. Midirabanan, but from the rabbis who say we don't allow you to sell it, lo yiga, don't touch, nishma de'emo redim karov l'nechse shavoy. So from the rabbis, it seems like they wouldn't allow a relative to go into the property of their relative who was taken captive because you're not allowed to touch their stuff, even if there might be a loss. So now they're going to say, this is not necessarily connected. In the case of our Mishnah, you were going to lose the fruits. But if I... if Nobody works the land. The land is still going to be there. The only thing is your relative is going to miss out on produce for that year. But hatam hachanami de'emoridim, because in the end, so just don't work the land for the year, but you're still going to have the land. No, it's not going to be ruined. And likewise, you could say the rabbis only said what they said in our Mishnah for the reasons we brought before. What were the reasons? Ela ikarav kahana, ikarav 
80 Holdak Rav Kahana, that people would prefer their own produce than nine Kav of someone else's produce. Or like Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak is worried maybe they took Truma from somewhere else and made that into Truma. And that's why you can't sell it. But those are not relevant for somebody's land. So maybe the rabbis would say, in the case of the captive, you would be allowed to. So basically, we showed that this is not at all connected. To which they say, So you think that whether or not you can go into the land of your relatives is based on a totally different reason than whether or not you can sell stuff that you're watching for somebody when it starts to get ruined. And why don't they think it's two reasons? Because look. And so that's quoting Shmuel saying we hold like Rashbag. And Amr Shmuel Muridim Karov Shavoy. And Shmuel said, We bring, we allow the relative to go into the property. So it must be the fact that Shmuel held like Rashbag there and that you could go into someone's prop your 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 relative who was taken captive, we we put we even encourage you to go to their property and to deal with it, it must be it's all based on the same reason of worrying about causing a loss for a friend's property. To which they say, Lo, Tre Tamaninu, no, they're two totally different reasons. And Hafinami Mustabra, and here we'll prove that they're for two totally different reasons and unconnected Maklokot to Amarav Amarav Nachman Halachaka de Rechachamim, but Amarav Nachman will redeem Karov Lenuk Seshavoy. Rav Nachman ruled differently in each case. In our mission, he actually held like the rabbis against Rashbag. And in the case of the captive, he said, we're allowed to send the relative to the captive's land. El Shmamina, so we come, must infer from here, Trey Tame Ninu, it's two different reasons, Shmamina. So from here, you can infer two totally different reasons. Okay, now, we're going to get into this topic of the relative and exactly in what cases there are a debate. And let's see. So first of all, I just want to point out the, the fact that the relative is doing it is very relevant. And we're going to see that in a minute. Because the relative is a potential heir. Captives, there's always a concern, unfortunately we know this very well, that the captives might die in captivity. And therefore, there's a concern that maybe the person's dead. Okay? And if the person's dead, then the relative would be the one to be the most appropriate person to go because eventually, right, and, and not only that, even if it's not, the, even if they're not dead, well, the relative eventually might be the one to inherit. So they have an interest in doing what's best for the property. Okay, so that's also another reason. Anyway, interesting topic. Let's see what they say. Itmar. It was said, again, introduction to a machloka between two emoraim. Shavoy shenishba. So we have someone who was taken captive. Ravamal. Ein moridim karov lenechasa. Rav rules, we do not let a relative go. And Shmuel Amar Moridim Karov Lechasav. And Shmuel says we do. So now we saw already Shmuel before. Here we see it in, again in his Machloket with Rav. If there's rumors that the person is no longer alive, then for sure, even Rav agrees, we allow the relative to go. And why is that? Because either, okay, you can look at Rashi. Rashi says, Bishasham Ubo Shemet Kuleamalo Pligi de Moridim. That's just what we just said in the Gemara. If the owners come before, you know, let's say the owner really isn't dead. Okay, you think they're dead. You heard rumors, but you don't know. So if they show up, so they'll get the proceeds, right? So it only helps them. And you told that what will you get if you dealt with their property? You'll get like a share crop. So it's in everyone's best interest. The Imavoidim Shemade, and if witnesses come and say the person's dead, well then Yirasha called, then you'll inherit it all. So therefore everybody agrees, no problem. You can work the land. He pligi bishalosha muboshame. If there's no rumors and we just that they're that they were killed, we just hear that they were captives. Ravamar Emoridim, Dilma Mafsid Lehu. Because maybe you'll ruin the land. Now, if you don't think they're dead and you think they're gonna come back, then you have the land right now. Now what while you have the land, you get the proceeds because there is no one else to take the proceeds, your relatives in captivity. So you take the proceeds, right? There's no such concept as put in a bank for them, okay? You get the proceeds. So you might work the land in a way, there's different ways to work land, that will produce the most produce for this year, but ultimately will cause the land to get ruined because you'll maybe plant too many things and you won't tend to the land as much and you'll just grow things fast. You know, and and quick, but by ruining the land, it might be too much. So 
that's that's in the negative interest of your relative because you're going to ruin the land for the long term. In other words, it's like anything. There's a different way to invest your money for short-term gains and for long-term gains. So you're going for the short-term because you assume the person's coming back. Why? Well, you're going to get a percentage anyway. So basically, when they come back, you'll be treated like a sharecropper and therefore you'll tend to the land properly because a sharecropper is like a part owner of the land. So you'll feel like you're a part owner of the land and therefore you'll tend to the land properly. Now we're going to bring a difficulty on Shmua from a bright. Again, Shmua says, we allow the relative to go into the property. So Rabi Elazarama, this is a, a verse in Sefer Shmot. It says, I will get angry and I will kill you. God says, this is what's going to happen. And I'll kill you with the sword. And your wives will become widows and your sons will become orphans. Now, the Torah doesn't waste words. So when it says, I will kill you, I'm going to kill you, then obviously your wives will be widows and your children will be orphans. So So why bother saying that second part of the sentence? To which they answer, Your wives are going to try to get married and they will not be successful. That's the curse. What do the children want to do when the father dies, inherit the property. And they won't let them. Why is this? Both situations. Because you're going to die and no one's going to know you're dead. So your wives can't get remarried. That's a horrible situation of an aguna. And the children will not be able to inherit. And what do you see here? Sounds like they can't inherit. Sounds like they can't even go down to the land at all. They'll have no access to your property. To which they resolve this by saying, I'm a rava. They meant that the children can't go into the property and sell it, but they could go in and use it and work the land and get the produce and the proceeds. That's Rava anyway. But now we're going back to the basic understanding of that source. There was a case in Nehardia, and he basically wouldn't allow the children, right? We didn't know if the father was dead or not, and they wouldn't allow the heirs to go into the property based on the simple reading of that source. So Rav Amram says, what do you mean? Why don't we go, you know, he suggests the same thing as Rav said. Maybe it means they can't sell it, but they could go down and use it. Amarleh, to which Rav Shesh gets very upset at him and says, Dilman mi Pupadita at, and this very insulting line, what, are you from Pupadita? Dima'ailin pila bekofa demachta, to try to fit uh, an elephant into the eye of a needle, okay, kind of an interesting image. And basically, what you're trying to fit in is a crazy commentary into this bright time. In other words, you're totally misunderstanding the source. It's an absurd suggestion to say that. Why is it so absurd? And why is Rav Sheshit so convinced he's right? Because notice they compare the wives and the children. Now, the wives can't get remarried because their husband might not be dead and they have no proof. So Mahatam Klalo, now there isn't such thing as partial marriage, right? It's not like they can be with men but not marry them, right? They can't at all. They're a married woman. So, also, in the case of the orphan, we say not at all. No way, no how, not in any way are those orphans allowed to go to the land. And that then, again, this would go against Shmuel. Obviously, Shmuel can bring Rava's explanation and say, oh, that's the way I read this source. But there is another way to read the source, and that's the way Rav Shesha read it. We're now going to end with saying that this machloka between Rav and Shmuel is also machloka between Tanaim. How so? If you go into a, a, your relatives or any anyone at captives' land, we don't remove you. Okay, you can go work their land while they're no while they're not there. And let's say you thought they were dead, which we're going to see in a minute. This is someone you thought was dead. And then you hear that they're coming back and they start coming and you see them coming. Okay. Or you hear them coming. This is an unbelievable source. And you quickly take, because while they're not there, you can eat the produce. So you quickly take as many, as much produce as you can and eat it. You're, you're a very, um, what do you say? Uh, 
uh, can't think of the word, but you do things quickly, right? And, and, and you get rewarded. In other words, even though it seems a little inappropriate, but since you work the land, as long as they haven't gotten back, any proceeds are yours. The second they come back, the proceeds are theirs. You can share and get a percentage as a sharecropper, but you won't get all of them. So that was a smart move on your part. Okay, but what does this mean basically? That it's yours to use. No problem, not at, right? So this obviously holds like Shmuel. What is this? What's the example of Shvuyim? And this is what I already said. This is one of your relatives, your father, your brother, your, you know, someone who is one of your relatives that you would inherit. They went abroad. And you heard that they died. By the way, this doesn't necessarily mean you're even in captive. It's just someone who were concerned they died. Here comes the second half. If you go to property of a natush, abandoned property, we do not let you. Now, what does abandoned mean? And this is going to be the same case that Rav and Shmuel had a machloket because, and this is where we're going to see the same machloket in the Tanaim. So this says, Again, as one of your potential people you could inherit. They just went abroad. We have no idea that they died. We have no rumor, no reason to think they died. So then you can't go into the land. So that's like Rav. Here comes the dissenting opinion. What do you mean? I heard that Nitushim are like Shvuyim. They're like captives, which means you can go into the land. That's Shmuel. So here you see the exact same machloket. We'll finish with one more line of this bright tap. What is Ritushim? Okay, so if you go to Nechsei Ritushim, everybody agrees that we don't allow this. What is Ritushim? They're in town. But we can't find them. So that, there's really no concern that they die just because if they're still in town and you can't find them, that's not a reason to go into their property. And then the Gemara just asked this question, which we'll answer tomorrow. Why are they called Nitushim and they called Ritushim? And we'll get back to this. So let's do a quick review of our daf. We started with the Mishnah. We had a Mishnah, Machlok at Rashbag and the rabbis about if the fruit's rotting, are you allowed, right? On the earlier stage of the rotting, are you allowed to return it, uh, to sell it? Or do you have to leave it alone if you're watching somebody's fruits? And we saw the rabbi said no, and we had two different reasons. Then we added Rabbi Yochanan, who said only if, that's only if it's starting to rot, but if it's really bad, more than what is anticipated, or it's almost going bad completely, then you're allowed to sell it. And then he said he disagrees with Rabbi Nachman, but actually Rabbi Kahana would agree with him, that was based on Rabbi Kahana, Rabbi Nachman's reasons in the Mishnah. Then we had two difficulties against Rabbi Yochanan. We resolved them both, and with that we learned some other things. Then we went back to who do we hold like in the mission? Do we hold like Rosh Baga? Do we hold like the rabbis? We saw a difference of opinion. And then we just asked this problem with Rabbi Yochanan. Why did you tell us Rabbi Yochanan holds like Rosh Baga? Doesn't he always hold like Rosh Baga? Other than those three situations. Then we wanted to say, is this Machloket in the Mishnah connected with the same question about can you go into a captive's property or should you go and work their land for them when they're not there? because you have to make sure that the property doesn't get ruined. Well, we in the end said this really isn't connected. It's two different things because of we gave some of the differences. Then we got into this machloka Rav and Shmuel about if your relative is taken captive, do we send a relative to, right? Do we send you to go deal with the property or not? And then we said, if there's rumors they're dead, then we definitely send you. The machloka is if there's no rumors that they're dead, we don't really know, then there's a machloka Rav and Shmuel, and then we proved it's also a machloka between Tanaim. And with that, we finished today's stuff. Wishing everybody Shabbat Shalom and a Shavuot.